All right, open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Now, chapter 6 records the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and many other notable events that we have taught from before. I've spent several messages. If you go back, you'll remember that I have spent several messages from John chapter 6. After those events, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, King James, or Judea, the province outside of Jerusalem, because the Jews sought to kill him. Please understand that the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem had been plotting the death of Jesus for several years. This was not, whenever they crucified him, it was not a, an extemporaneous event. It was not an overnight event. The Jewish leaders had been plotting, not only plotting the death of Jesus for years, but they had several times attempted to seize him and to execute him before the time that he was executed. And we're going to see this again in our chapter here in John chapter 7. As a, as a result of the tremendous animus of the Jewish leaders and the constant risk that he was of arrest and execution, Jesus focused most of his ministry outside of Judea and in the area around Galilee. And this is what he was doing at this point. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him. Now his brethren, the, the, uh, the way that the, uh, the Hebrew uh, would refer to kinfolk would, would usually be like father, son, or brethren, but it could, it could mean a, a blood brother, or it could mean a distant relative, like cousin. Uh, or if you say father, son, it could have meant father and son. It could have meant father and grandson. Uh, they were not always uh, specific as to the relationship between the individuals that what they were referring to. You have to study the, the scripture a little bit more detail when you, when you read these kind of things. Was this the actual brothers of Christ, the half-brothers of the Lord, the, the sons and daughters of uh, Joseph and Mary, or would this have been uh, cousins uh, or other near kinsmen? Could be either or. But whoever they were, they were close kinfolk of Jesus. At this point, they were not disciples of the Lord. They had not recognized him to be nor accepted him to be the Messiah and Savior. They were outside of faith. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go to Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. They are being sar sarcastic here. This is, not, this is not advice predicated upon their compassion for Jesus. This is, this is dripping with sarcasm. Uh, what they are saying to him is, Why are you staying in Galilee? Why don't you go to Judea and let the disciples there see your miracles? Why are you staying here? And they knew why. They knew why he was staying in Galilee. He knew the threat. I mean, they knew the threat. They knew the risk. They knew the attempts by the Sanhedrin to arrest and to kill him. They were just mocking him for remaining in Galilee. Verse 4, for there's no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And then John writes this, for neither did his brethren believe on him. He's reminding us that these were not 
they were, they were brethren in the flesh. They were kinfolk in the flesh, but they were not disciples. They were not followers of Christ. And they were being extremely sarcastic toward him. So the next time you have an unbelieving relative act sarcastically toward you, you're in good company. That's exactly what they did to the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not come, but your time is always ready. You know, it's amazing. Th this is a great comeback. It's amazing to me how many people who are willing to risk nothing have all kinds of advice to give to people who are willing to risk everything. When Jesus walked into Judea, he risked everything. When they walked into Judea, they risked nothing. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying to them. You can go anytime you want without risk. You're trying to piously tell me what to do when you are unwilling to risk anything and I am risking everything for my ministry. The world cannot hate you. Is it too cold? I see people putting coats on. All right. The, if the world cannot hate you, but, if it, but it hateth me, because I testify of it, and the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto the feast, and I will go up yet unto this feast. I will go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet come. It's not time for me to die. It's not time for me to go to that feast. I will go when I know I should go. I will not go because you think I should go, or you think the timing is right. You can go and do anything you want. You have nothing to lose, nothing to risk. Don't preach to me. Yeah, oh, Pastor Chuck, you ought to do this. Oh, you ought to go over there and then. You ought to do this. You know. Yeah, what are you doing lately? Until you start risking your neck, don't tell me how to risk mine. Sit back in the safety of do nothingism with no risk and have all this pious advice for those men and women who are out there in the forefront of the fight every day and are willing to put it all on the line. Shut up! That's a quote from Jay Leno. I didn't say that. That's right. <laughs> Verse 9. When he had said these words, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, so they went ahead to Jerusalem to the feast, then went he also up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. He took his disciples at a separate time, privately, without the crowds, without the fanfare, without the notice. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Everywhere Jesus went, he divided people everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, he divided folks. You mentioned the name of Jesus, and you either wanted to kiss the fella or you wanted to punch him in the nose. You either puckered up or you ducked. That's the way it was. You either hated him or you loved him. The division of the people, and we're going to see this throughout this passage. Much murmuring. Some said he's a good man. Others said, no, he's a deceiver. Howbeit no man spake openly of him, favorably, for fear of the Jews. 
Isn't it amazing how people are willing to allow themselves to be put in bondage due to the fear of men? The fear of men in the Old Testament bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. These people were so intimidated by the powers that be, they would not even speak favorably of Jesus in public. How many people are there? Name the profession. Name the profession. In their hearts, they know who the Lord God is. In their hearts, they do believe in his message, in his ministry, his work, the principles he stood for, the cross he died on. In their hearts, they believe it. But when they are in the, in the presence of their fellow, fill in the blank, doctors, Attorneys, engineers, businessmen, construction workers, teachers, military personnel, they will not speak openly in favor of him. I have some messages over there about that. One of them is, the Lord hath not given us the spirit of fear. You need to get that. Give it to somebody. God's people are required. There is a, a, only a few characteristics that are required of us. We all have our various strengths and weaknesses and so forth and so on. But there's a few things that are constant in the life of a disciple of our Lord. One of them, of course, the first one is love. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. You're a sounding brass, tinkling cymbal, you got nothing. I don't care how much Bible you know. I don't care how doctrinally pure you think you are. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. Humility. Pride is the first thing that God hates in the list in Proverbs chapter 6. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. Number one, law first mentioned, a proud look. Humility is absolutely required of us. And courage. Courage is required of us. It's not optional. It's not, well, I'm just timid by nature. That may be so, but if you're a Christian and you know what's right, you have an obligation to be courageous in the application of God's will in your life. There's no option. Our personalities are different, of course. Our temperaments are different, but the courage factor is constant. And here they were. These were men and women that believed in him, that knew him to be who he was, but they would not speak of him for fear of what the Jewish leaders would say or do to them. We got, we got Christians all over America that are in these dead churches that will not take a stand. The pastor will not take a stand. They will go along with anything, no matter how egregiously tyrannical it may happen to be, say nothing to deliver the souls of their, of their families from the oppression of the enemy. And there are Christians within those congregations who in their heart know this is wrong. They believe what's right. They know what's right. And yet every Sunday they go to these churches and they silence their voice and they will not speak up in the board of trustees meeting or in the elders meeting or in the deacons meeting or in the pastoral staff. They will not speak the truth for fear of the peer pressure of those around them. That's disgusting. 
Just like that senator who wrote us and said, Chuck, I've been trying to get pastors to speak out for years and can't get them to speak out. And not only will they not speak out, they will try to intimidate those in the congregation who will speak out. Such were these folks. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up unto the temple and taught. Okay, now it's time for him to go to the temple and let him have it. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? <laughs> you know what they're saying here? These are the Jewish hot shots. You know, these are the Sanhedrin. These are the, the elite. You know what they're saying? They're saying, How does this man know so much about the Old Testament scripture, the letters, is a reference to the Old Testament scripture. How does he know so much about the Old Testament scripture? Seeing he never graduated from one of our schools. That's exactly what they were saying. Exactly what they were saying. The, the, the Jewish leadership, uh, Hillel and Shammai and others, had notable schools where the, the disciples of the Sanhedrin would study the Old Testament law under the tutelage of these Pharisees. Jesus never went to Harvard. He didn't go to Princeton. He didn't even go to Yale. How? Does he know all of this? He didn't go to our schools. He didn't sit under our professors. Where did he learn this? Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Oh, don't you got to love Jesus? Courage! Didn't Moses give you the law? Yes. And yet none of you keep the law. You don't keep it. Why go you about to kill me? What, what they were upset about here at this latest event was chapter 6, when he healed the man on the Sabbath. He healed a man on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees said, he broke the law. He did work on the Sabbath. And they were going to arrest him and execute him because he healed a man on the Sabbath day. Jesus said, you break the law all the time. You circumcise on the Sabbath day. That was a common practice. The Pharisees routinely would circumcise on the Sabbath day. Jesus said, you condemn me for giving a man healing on the Sabbath day when you will turn around and circumcise your little male boys on the Sabbath day. The people answered and said, <laughs> this is so irrelevant to everything going on today, isn't it? Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill you? Who, we're not, who's trying to kill you? Who's trying to kill you? You must be paranoid. <laughs> Who's trying to kill you? You must be a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Who's trying to kill you? As they hide their axe behind their back. 
Jesus answered and said to them, I have done one work. I healed the man. And you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of, your, of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, and are angry at me, because I made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And folks, that's a verse you need to underline. That's a verse you need to memorize. That's a verse that you need to make a very high priority in your personal life. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You don't see the motive of the heart. You don't see the attitude, the spirit. You don't understand, perhaps, the circumstances. You're making a judgment purely based upon circumstantial evidence. What you saw with your myopic knowledge, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. There's more to it than just what meets the eye. And there are Christians all over America that are sitting in judgment over their fellow Christians on the appearance only. They're not judging righteously. They don't know the whole story. They don't know the heart. They don't know the motive. They don't know the circumstance, but they are willing to set them up, set themselves up as judge, jury, and moral executioner based upon what they saw in someone else's life. You are acting just like a Pharisee when you do that. Judge righteous judgment. Now, this is a great verse, and Adam Clark, one of my favorite commentators who wrote back in the 1800s, here's what he had to say about this. Attend to the law, not merely in the letter, but in its spirit and design. Remember what the New Testament said, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. If you don't put the spirit of the law into the letter of the law, what you wind up with, the abuse of the law. And that's what's going on in our churches, spiritually. And that's what's going on in Washington, D.C., politically. They are exempting the spirit of the law from the letter of the law. And they are ruining the intent of the law. Back to Clark. Learn that the law which, commend, which commands men to rest on the Sabbath day is subordinate to the law of mercy and love which requires them to be ever active to promote God's glory in the comfort and salvation of the fellow creatures. I got a message over there about the greater law. If you haven't heard that or watched that, please. Do we have that over there? I think, I think we got that. The, 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 the greater law. We went over this. We talked about this. The Sabbath and the law of the Sabbath and what the greater laws were to the Sabbath. You need to get that. The natural laws, the, the, the moral laws of man are greater in authority than the man-made laws that try to demand obedience even over the natural laws of God. That, and that's what so many Christians are not getting. It, it, all right. Here's a, a, a sign on the lake that says no swimming. The, the city ordinance passed the law saying no swimming. You violate the law of government. 
if you swim in the lake. But there's a little boy a few feet out in the lake who's drowning. Do you stand back as a Pharisee and say, the law says I can't go swimming and let the little boy drown? Or do you violate the law that says no swimming and you dive out into the water and you save the life of the little boy in fulfillment of the natural law of Christ. These are the kind of things that we're facing more and more frequently as, as believers in the word and law of God because more and more the government of men is trying to supplant the natural law of God and telling us we don't have the right to obey the law of God. The law of man is supreme. No, it's not. Jesus is saying, you are putting all of this emphasis on the Old Testament law of the Sabbath. But you're ignoring the weighter matters of the law. I healed a man. Clark, learn that the law which commands men to rest on the Sabbath day is subordinate to the law of mercy and love, which requires them to never be active to promote God's glory, etc. And endeavor to judge of the merit or demerit of an action, not from the first impression it may make upon your prejudices, but from its tendency and the motives of the person as far as it is possible for you to acquaint yourselves with them, still believing the best where you have no certain proof to the contrary. Tremendous words. You won't read that in the commentaries that you pick up on the Christian bookstores today. Verse 45. Excuse me, let's keep going in verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? Everybody knew they were trying to kill him. Everybody knew they were trying to kill him. Is not this him that they're trying to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Okay. Let me tell you how to explain this. This is the double speak that's going on here. They're saying, "All right, is, is this, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? They, they knew who he was. And yet he speaks openly and boldly. And they haven't taken him. And then they say, oh, wait a minute. When Christ comes, we're not going to know where he's from. But with this guy, we know everything about him. We know he's born in Bethlehem. We know he's raised in in, in Nazareth, we know that he ministered in Galilee. Well, we know everything about this guy. But when the Messiah comes, we're not going to know all that. Time out. Where do you find that? Anywhere in the Bible? Where do you find that? Where do you, where do you find anywhere in the Bible that you're not going to know anything about where the Messiah comes from? This is typical of pharisaical doctrine. They take the Bible and then they add their own interpretations and opinions and teach those opinions as if they were Bible doctrine. You won't find anything anywhere in the Old Testament law about the Messiah being hidden, not knowing where he's coming from, not knowing where he was born. The Bible predicted where he would be born. Everybody knew where he was born. Everybody knew where he was raised. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Said Nathaniel when he was called to be a disciple. They knew where he was from. They knew he lived in Galilee. They knew that most of the disciples were from Galilee. They knew everything about him. Oh, but wait a minute. Isn't the Messiah supposed to be of some unknown Origin, we don't know where he is, where he came from. Where'd they get that? Where'd they get that? Where'd they get that? From the Pharisees. 
The school of the Pharisees taught that kind of thing. That's the problem when you graduate from some of these schools and colleges. The first thing you have to do after you graduate is unlearn half of everything that you learn. say that. They're, ju they, they're just saying that because of what they were taught by the Pharisees. Then cried Jesus in the temple. He, heard, he overheard him and he shouted. He didn't speak it softly. You both know me and you know where I am and you know I've come on myself but he that sent me is true whom you know not. You know where I came from. You know who I am. But I know him for I am from him and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, arrest him, seize him, take him to the Sanhedrin, put him on trial. They sought to take him. But no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? You really think there's going to come somebody later that's going to do more miracles than this man has come, has done? The Pharisees heard the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Okay? Again, a formal arrest warrant has now been issued by the chief priests. Who had the power to do this under Roman law? To seize him, arrest him, and take him to trial. They sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while I was with you, and I shall go unto him that sent me. And ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, there ye cannot come. Six months. Six months from the time Jesus spoke these words, he was hanging on a cross. That's why he said, A little while, and I will be with you. But where I'm going, you're not ever going to make it. <laughs> You shall seek me and shall not find me, and you're not going to come where I am. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go? And we can't find him. Will he go to disperse among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this? That he said, You shall seek me and shall not find me, and whither I am, there you cannot come. They didn't understand anything about Jesus. Their rejection of him had blinded them to everything he said and did. I'm going to skip down to verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard these things, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? By the prophet, that could mean Elijah. Remember whenever... Jesus first came, Herod believed that this was Elijah come back from the dead. And some believed that he was the prophet Elijah based upon the prophecy of Zechariah in the Old Testament. Others thought it would be an unnamed prophet that refers to the, what Moses said, that God would send a prophet. Moses was speaking of Christ, of course, but they didn't understand that so they said is this the prophet whatever prophet they had in mind others said this is the Christ but then others said well wait a minute is, is Jesus is, is Christ coming out of Galilee hath not the spirit said the scripture that Christ cometh from the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was so obviously some I guess were ignorant of his birth so there was a division among the people because of him if there's not a division You're not saying much. You're not doing much. If you're not creating a division, you are pretty much worthless. Jay Leno didn't say that. Chuck Baldwin said that. There was a division because of him. Some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests. So while they were 
coming to arrest him, Jesus was speaking the words that we just read. If you have a red letter edition, the words that are in red, Jesus was just speaking those words. When they came to arrest him, they listened to his words, they saw the people, they didn't arrest him. They came, the officers, to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why have ye not brought him? Where is he? The officer said, Never man spake like this man. Can you imagine? The officer corps of the Pharisees didn't arrest him because they, after listening to him, they were so taken by his words and the spirit that they felt from his words and the power of his words, the purity of his words, they didn't have it in them to arrest him. I told you a couple Wednesday nights ago. Back in 1990, can't remember, five, Commander Guy Cunningham, who's a personal friend of mine, was stationed as an officer at 29 Palms, California. He conducted a survey of the Marines that were stationed at 29 Palms at that time. It was a very, very lengthy survey. In the midst of the survey was two or three questions. The, uh, the one who, which brought the most focus was his question. If you were ordered to turn your weapons upon the American citizenry, would you comply with that order. Again, mid-90s. At that time, 25% of the Marines at 29 Palms, California, who took the survey said, yes, they would fire on the American citizenry if ordered to do so. That same question was asked to the current Marine Corps personnel at 29 Palms, California, last year in 2013. The result of the question in 2013 was 66% of the Marines said they would fire their weapons on the American citizenry if ordered to do so. So in a little over 20 some odd years, we've gone from 25% to 66% who said they would turn their weapons on the American people under orders. Now, first of all, how could that happen? How could that happen? I'll tell you exactly how it's happened. The pastors of America have not taught their congregations the truth. The fault is not the politicians. The fault is not the media. The fault is not the educators in higher instruction. The fault is the pulpit. They are not teaching the young people in their churches the truth about the natural laws of God. And as a result, these young men are going into these institutions. They're being programmed and indoctrinated. They do not have a moral compass. They do not know what to do in the face of that kind of a question and they are lost to the political wolves that prey on their souls. The pastors of America are sacrificing the lives and liberties of the people of this country. Christian, get out of those churches! Yeah. 
Where are the pastors who will say to their young men, there are natural laws at work here, youngsters. There are laws in place here. There were Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II that covered all of this. You do not violate the laws of God in order to comply with inferior laws of men that are contrary to the laws of God. Your obedience is to the highest power, which is God Almighty. You must say no. If the pastors were doing their jobs, we wouldn't have a statistic. I promise you that among those 66% of those young Marines who said they would fire their weapons if ordered to do so on the American people, I promise you that a sizable percentage of those young men came out of evangelical churches in America. They were taught in Sunday school. They went to the youth group. They were in church on Sunday. They've got Christian parents. They want to have a pastor, a youth pastor. They go off in the Marine Corps, and the church sent them off in a grand farewell. And a few months later, they answer a survey that says, yeah, I'll go back home and open my guns on my pastor, in my friends, in my fellow, my fellow churchmen. Yeah, if ordered to do so, I'll shoot them all. These pastors don't realize, maybe some do, but I don't think, I don't think most of them realize the harm they are doing to our country by their silence. They don't realize the implications, and the ramifications. And one day, the chickens are going to come home to roost, and they are going to pay the price for the negligence they've shown in not being willing to declare the whole word of God to their congregations. These men went to arrest Jesus had orders in their hand to do it. And they came back without him. Yeah, we need, we need sheriff's deputies, we need city policemen, we need state patrolmen, we need national guard, we need military personnel that whenever the orders come down from above violate the natural rights of their fellow citizens, they say, sorry, I won't do it. We need to really be praying for these, our, our Border Patrol personnel right now. I, when I, I, I'm, I, spent a lot of, I spent quite a bit of time on the border back in 2008 and 2009, mostly in California and Arizona. I met scores of Border Patrol officers. I can tell you that most of the ones that I met were good, moral, patriotic, sincere, freedom-loving men that were trying to serve their country. Right. Most of them were. These men are now being placed in a situation that is the most extreme circumstance that could possibly be known to an officer of their, of their station. Border Patrol personnel are leaving the Border Patrol by the scores and hundreds. Most of these men understand the Constitution, the law, and they see the utter breakdown of law at the border. Their lives are at stake. The media is not telling you that just about every day along the border, our Border Patrol personnel are being fired upon by Mexican gangs and coyotes and illegals along the border. Just about every day they're being fired upon. And many of the times, if not most of the times, these officers are not even allowed to fire their weapons. 
They're not allowed to chamber around in their guns. They, they are working under the most extreme conditions possible. Just a few days ago, a Border Patrol agent who was off duty enjoying a time of recreation with his family was gunned down and murdered by two illegal aliens. This kind of thing is going on all the time. I t I'm telling you, the good men and women of law enforcement and military, etc., it's going to become more and more challenging for, th for them to maintain fidelity to the principles of honor and truth and constitutional government in the face of a totally corrupt and illegal government in Washington, D.C. We really need to pray for these men and women, yes. sincerely. Yes. The officers came to arrest. They would not do it. The chief priest, why have you brought them? No man spake like, they answered, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Now you're getting a real glimpse into the elitism of these folks. Do you know any Pharisees that had believed on him? As if that means that he must be a deceiver. Do you know anybody in our crowd that has believed on him? No? Well, that means he must be no good. Oh, the arrogance. The arrogance. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Whose are the this people they're talking about? Who are the this people that don't know the law? They're the common people that didn't go to Harvard. The common people that didn't go to Princeton. The common people that didn't go to the schools of Hillel and Shema. They didn't graduate from the Pharisaical schools, and so they're unlearned, unwashed, common rabble. Elitists always look down their nose at common people. If you're not of their school, if you're not of their credentials, then you are nothing. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, John 3, being one of them. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? This is what Albert Barnes says about this passage, this people. The word here translated people is one commonly rendered the multitude. It is a word expressive of contempt or as we would say, the rabble. It denotes the scorn which they felt that the people should presume to judge for themselves in a case pertaining to their own salvation. How dare you think for yourselves? Who knoweth not the law? Who have not been instructed in the schools of the Pharisees? Have been taught to interpret the Old Testament as they had? They suppose that any who believed in the humble and despised Jesus must be, of course, ignorant of the true doctrines of the Old Testament as they held that a very different Messiah from him was foretold. Many instances are preserved in the writings of the Jews of the great contempt in which the Pharisees held the common people. It may be here to remark that Christianity is the only system of religion ever presented to man that in a proper manner regards the poor, the ignorant, and the needy. Philosophers and Pharisees in all ages have looked on them with contempt. So they were contemptible in their eyes. Who are they? These common peasants who believe on you. And, and let me tell you something, folks. These Pharisee-type elitists are still very much with us in 2014. Still very much with us. They're in higher education. They're in government, politics. 
They're in various stations of life. They alone are worthy of leadership because the rest of the people don't know anything and cannot be trusted with truth or law or self-government. Verse 50, Nicodemus. That is one of the great council of Sanhedrin, one of them. God often places one, this is Albert Barnes, one or more pious men in legislative assemblies to vindicate his honor and his law. And he often gives a man grace on such occasions boldly to defend his cause, to put men upon their proof, to confound the proud and the domineering. We see in this case also that a man at one time timid and fearful, John 3 came to Jesus by night, may on another occasion be bold and fearlessly defend the truth. This example should lead every man entrusted with authority or office fearlessly to defend the truth of God. And when the rich and the mighty are pouring contempt on Jesus and his cause to stand forth as its fearless defender. That's every one of our jobs. Every one of us. When you hear someone promulgating error, I, I don't mean disagreement and differences of opinion, opinion. I mean error from truth. When you're out there and you hear people, even in the fellowship, if you hear people spreading gossip and slander and discord and things of that nature in the fellowship, you have a moral and spiritual obligation to place yourself in the middle of that conversation and say, no, you will not say that about these good folks in my presence. You have an obligation to the truth. Don't condemn the politicians who won't stand. Don't condemn the pastors who won't stand. Don't condemn the college professors who won't stand for the truth in their sphere of influence when you won't stand for the truth where you are. We all have an obligation to be spokesmen for the truth in whatever venue we may find ourselves. Doth not our law judge any man? Ah, I got to give you this in closing. Again, Albert Barnes. The law required justice to be done and gave every man the right to claim a fair and impartial trial. This is the Old Testament. Their condemnation of Jesus was a violation of every rule of right. He was not arraigned. He was not heard in self-defense. Not a single witness was adduced. Nicodemus demanded that justice be done and that he should not be condemned until he had had a fair trial. Every man, still quoting, Every man should be presumed to be innocent until he is proved to be guilty. That is a maxim of law and a most just and proper precept in our judgments in private life. Albert Barnes. Oh, wow. Um, Our entire American jurisprudence is predicated upon that premise that a person is innocent until proven guilty. Our courts today, and I'm talking about the juries for the most part, that sit inside these courts have lost that understanding of innocent until proven guilty for the most part, and judge men guilty by appearance. We have millions of people in our penal institutions across America that are as innocent of a crime as you or I. But they have been put there by juries who assume guilt 
and will side with the prosecutors and law enforcement even when evidence is not sufficient to prove guilt. It's a major problem in our judicial, I mean, in, in our court system. It's a major problem, major problem. And, what's, and what really bothers me most about it is the more Christian and the more conservative the community, the worse this problem is. It's terrible. You talk to many Christian conservative people and you know what their attitude is? Well, if he wasn't guilty, he wouldn't have been arrested. It's truth. It's a truth. You quiz the church members around this community. You have church member friends. Private conversation, let it casually come up. And see the responses you get. Yeah, if, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. If they weren't guilty, they wouldn't even be arrested. It is far better. I will say this slowly and carefully for deliberation. It is far better than 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man be condemned. We are turning into a police state in part predicated upon what I'm talking about now. Guilty by suggestion. We have national campaigns afoot all over America. Billboards, radio, television. See something? Say something. People are being paid to offer information anonymously against their neighbors. People are being encouraged. Now then we have first responders, including firemen, emergency personnel, medical personnel, cleanup crews, things of this nature that are now being schooled, being trained by federal officers on how to report their fellow citizens on certain signs. Signs could be as simple as the way they walk, the way they look, the way they chew gum. I threw that in. <laughs> Anything that looks suspicious, turn them in. We'll reward you with cash. You name never has to show up. Ladies and gentlemen, unless you have read no history and have no appreciation whatsoever of what's happened before we got into this world, that is exactly what happened in every tyrannical regime, including Hitler and Stalin and Mao and you name it. That was exactly the kind of society that they had in those days. And that's being created now. The presupposition of guilt. Well, I don't like someone, so I'm just looking for an opportunity to turn them in. Have you ever, do you ever read that police blotter thing that's in the paper all the time? I mean, it's funny. It's funny. And what, I mean, you know, you read it and you just howl, you know. It's funny. But on the other hand, it's tragically sad. People turning in their neighbors for anything and everything. His dog pooped on my yard. Put him in jail. Really?
it's easy to see why the powers that be are, able, are as effective as they are in being able to construct this police state. When, look, we got, we got many homeowners associations that are far more dictatorial than anything out of Washington, D.C. I mean, to tell you, some of these homeowner associations would, would, would make Mao Zedong very, very proud to belong to their organization. I mean to tell you, they're tyrants. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Man, oh man. But again, it's all predicated on the, what we're talking about here. This isn't justice. This isn't justice. The proving of guilt. The, the consciousness of innocence without a, a proof of guilt, the, the tolerance of others in a land of freedom that it's more important that we not like what our neighbors do, but that our neighbors have a semblance of freedom than it is that we be a tyrant to dictate everything we like or don't like about what they do or don't do. What's more important? We've lost the whole notion of liberty and justice. With liberty and justice for none or some. People don't realize that when the tyranny they espouse and promote that damns and dooms their neighbor under the pretenses that they affirm are in the not too distant future going to come back upon them and they will be victimized by their own tyranny. Yes, right. And they didn't even seem to think about that. Nicodemus stood up for law, he stood up for justice confronted the other Pharisees on their illegal and immoral conduct. And they answered, Art thou also of Galilee? And every man went to his own house. Nicodemus, the man that came to Jesus by night, was responsible for breaking up the meeting of the Sanhedrin who were trying to arrest Jesus at that time those officers who refused to arrest him and Nicodemus who stood up for him as a member of the Sanhedrin in the court spared temporarily the physical safety of our Lord. Gave him six more months to minister before he went to the cross to die for our sins. How much time will we save on behalf of our community in our country, when we too are willing to say no to the unlawful dictates of men and to be able to stand in the face of tyranny with law and justice on our side and courageously taking our stand for the cause of right. How much more time will we allow for our fellow citizens, our family, our brothers and sisters to continue to live in a land of liberty? Our responsibility. Who knows that we have not already given America more time than it would have had had we not spoken. Let's stand for prayer.